Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Catherine Doe, a product marketing director here at Equifax for our risk portfolio. In this episode, we're focusing on the auto industry and how auto dealers and lenders can build resilience into their 2023 planning. But first, we'll get a quick economic update from Dr. David Fieldhouse, Director of Consumer Credit Analytics at Moody's Analytics. David? Thanks so much for having me. Uh, You know, when we look at the economic data and really the Q4 2022 economic data, it really suggests that we're at a turning point. And really, the Fed is getting what it wants. Industrial production fell sharply at the end of the month. We saw some disappointing retail sales numbers. You know, overall, there's a big dent in household wealth. House prices are falling and they'll continue to do so. Uh, Stock markets are down well below where they were just over a year ago. Looking at those December retail sales numbers, they really were a a bit disappointing overall. They were driven by a couple pieces, uh, low gas prices, new vehicle sales fell sharply in part because of the high interest rates, uh, and holiday sales were modest overall. I do want to point out that Retail sales in October were very strong, so it might be a case that buyers were really getting ahead, making their purchases early, and, and overall, retail sales numbers for the quarter were okay, but but the last December numbers were very weak. And in general, we're seeing a shift from goods purchases back to services, and some of this had been driven by really high inflation in the goods sectors until recently. But you know, overall, we're seeing inflation moderate, which is good. Core good prices are down 0.3%. And compared to a year ago, they're only up 2.1%, which is very comfortable for the Fed. You know, inflation is continuing, though, for services. So numbers are a bit higher than the core prices overall, but inflation looks to be on the right track. Our outlook for 2023 is soft, but we still do not have a recession in our forecast. We expect GDP to be very weak in the first half of the year, but still positive. And overall, in the entire year, we think it's going to be 1.3%. And we also assume that lawmakers are going to figure out how to handle the debt ceiling issue. But we do want to caution that there's a bit more uncertainty about how this will come to a conclusion than there has been in past episodes. So a little bit more uncertainty there that we're watching out for. If we want to look at our forecast for retail sales, we think retail sales will be modest in 2023. Most of the gain will be in prices. There'll be little real growth overall. High interest rates are going to make retail spending more expensive. So it's going to be harder to justify putting a purchase on your credit card uh, or maybe through some buy now, pay later, or you're not going to get that auto loan going into 2023 that you might have gotten with lower interest rates. And we think that consumers will still have a bit of excess savings that they can work their way through in 2023. So we don't think it's going to be a collapse in retail sales. We think overall, it's just going to be a modest growth, especially when we think about the outlook for GDP overall. Uh, and the biggest risk to in, in the retail space, we think are going to be energy prices. If energy prices go up, it's going to be obviously good for gasoline stations and fuel oil dealers, but the other segments would pay the price. So that's the risk that we see going forward in 2023. Turning back to the auto industry, we're seeing that used retail vehicle sales are down and auto loan performance continues to deteriorate. And that's according to the latest Cox Automotive Auto Market Weekly Summary. We're also anticipating a bright spot this year could be the expected EV market. To help us dig deeper into these insights and more, we're pleased to welcome back Jonathan Smoke, Chief Economist for Cox Automotive. Thanks for joining today, Jonathan. Uh, It's great to be with you, Catherine. Okay, Jonathan, we understand you're a DJ in your spare time, um, so I'm dying to know. Uh, what song comes to mind as you think about the auto industry in, in 2023? What song um, fits the bill for this year ahead? Well, I want to cheat, and I'm going to give you two. And it's sort of like asking me what my favorite song is uh, to a music lover. That's really challenging. But I publish an auto market playlist every few months on Spotify that includes songs that capture this the themes that I'm seeing in the economy and the auto market. And I just published my latest playlist and it focuses on songs from the early 80s. So there's way more than two if anybody wants to find it uh, on Spotify. But they are all songs that happen to be at the birth of MTV. And I chose that time frame because it was the last time the Fed raised rates so much. 
that it caused a recession. Um, so the first song apropos to that scenario is Do You Really Want to Hurt Me by Culture Club uh, from 40 years ago in 1983. Because I think realtors and auto dealers alike are singing this in their best Boy George voice uh, now, thanks to what we've already seen. And unfortunately, the Fed is not done yet. And despite the challenges uh, for the second song, I believe many auto dealers and manufacturers can find a way to succeed in 2023. So my favorite out of all of the playlists is also from 1983. Uh, which was the year we got past the recessions of 1981 and 1982. And I'm going to share the lyrics to see if you can guess it, Catherine. Um, so, no one wants to be defeated. Showing how funky and strong is your fight. It doesn't matter who's wrong or right. Just beat it. And beat it. Michael Jackson beat it, right? That, that's got to be. Okay. <laughs> That's right. So if you're in the auto business, listen to Michael for inspiration. Over the last two years, the auto industry has experienced severe inventory constraints, leading to record high vehicle prices. And with the looming threat of a recession or perhaps an economic downturn in 2023, but we're starting to see signs of recovery with the supply chain. What are your predictions for this year in terms of vehicle sales? Well, our predictions are not bullish for 2023. It's an unfortunate timing for the industry that many of the supply problems are starting to resolve just as the prospect of a recession all starts uh, to manifest itself. Uh, production is not back to normal, but it has started to recover and has been improving quickly over the last several months. We started 2023 with about 800,000 more vehicles and new vehicle inventory than we had a year ago. And mo most of that improvement came actually in the final four months of last year. But that still leaves us with uh, less than half of the inventory we had at the beginning of 2019. So we are by no means, quote unquote, back to normal. There are lingering production and supply chain issues, but we mainly see them when we look at vehicle production from the different regions of the world. Uh, basically, Asia and European production still see problems and have seen the least amount of recovery so far. But by contrast, North American production is close to normal. And as a result, we basically see domestic brands in the best shape from a supply perspective, while Asian and some European brands are further behind. The lingering supply chain issues lead us to assume that we won't bounce back to pre-COVID production and sales levels in 2023, but if we can avoid a recession, we should see recovery and new sales start to begin. And we think the most likely range is somewhere in the low 14s, 14.1 to 14.6 million is most likely. And that would only be a gain of about three to 7% uh, from last year's 13.7 million. But in addition to lingering supply chain and production problems outside of North America, what's possible in sales is also limited by the prospect of a recession and deteriorating demand. And I believe that manufacturers are weary to push production growth aggressively in that context. They have their suppliers already pushed. They have uh, labor challenges and there are new UAW contracts coming up for many uh, several manufacturers this year. So to see 10% or more growth, they run the risk of driving up labor and input costs to get that growth just as demand weakens. Um, so one of the reasons why we're pretty conservative in our outlook is simply put, if I were a manufacturer, I'd rather sell 13 million with no incentives like they did last year than sell 15 million with 2019's level of incentives, which was dramatically higher and more expensive for them. So as a result, I think many are already pulling back or at least getting ready to pull back from otherwise would be even stronger momentum. And that's a key reason we're on the low end of what some others are projecting. Yes, we could sell more, but the key question is really at what price? 
And then finally, if we do have a recession, we'll see production decline. As a result then of lower production and weaker demand, we think we could see another leg down of 10%, much like the decline that we had in 2022. But if you add the 2022 and 23 declines in such a recession scenario, the decline would not be as bad as an average recession that we've experienced historically. Furthermore, we're very supply constrained, and this would end up being a far more profitable recession for manufacturers and dealers alike, which is a concept that none of us really contemplated prior to kind of living through these current conditions. That's a lot of great insight there. I did want to go back to, you mentioned the U.S.'s and supply chain um, and production is looking more favorable than in some other regions. Why is that? Is it anything to do with policy? Is it uh, COVID, um, waves of COVID continuing, materials? Yeah, it's it's a combination of things. Um, uh, one is our approach to COVID uh, means that North America has uh, basically built up immunity through exposure and through uh, effective vaccinations as diametrically opposed to the COVID st uh, strategy that China uh, pursued that is leaving them uh, still subjected to a lot of risks of outbreaks, but also uh, shutting down uh, parts of the economy as they deal with those outbreaks. And uh, so as a result, Asia has essentially taken several steps back at times in 2022, when in North America, we were powering ahead. And I think Europe would probably be in the same place that we are in North America had it not been for the war in Ukraine. And the war in Ukraine um, has uh, disrupted some of the assembly work that happens across Eastern Europe. But most importantly, it's really the overall impact it's had on uh, energy costs and energy availability that has otherwise uh, throttled the overall production that we see across the board uh, in Europe. So it's really, I, you know, I guess it's good policy on COVID, bad luck, um, you know, having to do with the war. and But those things aren't going away. So again, it's another reason to expect to be conservative in expectations for how production rebounds in those regions of the world in 2023. And so it, you mentioned a lot, but I do, I am curious what do you see as the most, um, uh, the biggest challenge or the thing that um, if you were in this industry as as maybe, let's say, a dealer or a lender, um, maybe each of those, which which is the biggest challenge for, for each? Well, as we just discussed, a recession looms large, and I think that's on everybody's minds. It has implications for supply that people are not considering, uh, like I just mentioned, and of course, it would impact demand. You know, simply there's a positive correlation with vehicle demand related to job creation. So job loss doesn't help uh, vehicle demand if we were uh, to experience it. And a recession would delay the recovery of the new vehicle market yet another year. And when we look at the broader landscape for the used vehicle market, that delays the recovery that eventually uh, follows in the used uh, vehicle market as, as well. So that's definitely a top challenge. But beyond that economic cycle concern, I think the single biggest challenge facing the auto industry in 2023 and for years to come, frankly, is affordability. Uh, it is changing who can buy in the new vehicle market, and as a result, uh, it is changing what is being produced. Uh, with changes that have already occurred in what was produced over the last three years, we have a lack of affordable and young supply in the used vehicle market today. And then when you combine that with interest rates uh, now being at levels we haven't seen in 20 years, and we have a problem creating payments that are affordable to median and lower income households and to consumers with less than prime credit. And that's not a situation that's going to, to improve uh, for in the foreseeable future. So affordability, that's a great segue. Um, in my personal life, I was chatting with a neighbor about wanting to put a fence in my yard and got some quotes and, you know, lumber is, is that that's also gone up and down um, through COVID. And I got the quote and I said to her, you know, it's the price of a used Kia to put in a fence in my tiny yard. And then I realized 
It's actually not. <laughs> it would be two used Kias in today's market um, with affordability. Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking you, you mentioned um, making affordable payments or payments affordable for consumers um, is a challenge. Um, so is that changing the profile uh, for auto shoppers? And, and what does that look like for loans, um, terms? Um, what, what does that mean for the market? Yeah, it has huge impl implications. And I love the fact that you uh, immediately related it to a housing related uh, situation because affordability is unfortunately a hot topic in two major industries that are critical to living and working in the US, uh, housing and uh, automotive. And it's the lethal combination of product price inflation that has been a result of constrained production and supply uh, corresponding with very strong demand combined with now 20 year highs in, inter in interest rates. So it can't be solved very easily without changing all of those factors. And, and we don't see a resolution to those factors anytime soon. And in auto, uh, affordability is also being challenged by tighter credit conditions because one way that payments have been otherwise lower than what we would have seen over the last five to 10 years has been average terms have been expanding. But one of the things that we observed happening, especially towards the end of last year, is that average terms are now shortening again. Uh, and when you combine that with the other thing that we observed throughout last year uh, with down payments uh, growing, uh, that really uh, causes the consumer to have to put more money down um, get less af affordable payments. And of course, that uh, it's the payment that really matters in the affordability uh, calculation. The changes so far, uh, when you look at the composition of who's buying and how that's impacting the, the loan pool, has been most dramatic in the new vehicle market. Uh, last year, we saw, uh, for example, when we look at income distribution, uh, share gains of about seven percentage points in people with incomes over 125,000 at the expense of a uh, share of people who are in lower incomes uh, at median and, and lower levels. Um, in addition, we're seeing a clear drop, and I think it's even more dramatic in the credit data. Um, so we use uh, our dealer track platform is one of the top two indirect lending platforms in, in the country. So as a result of it, uh, through it, I can see very real time indicators of who's buying and what payments are they making and what kind of rates. Well, last year we saw a clear drop in subprime and deep, deep subprime consumers in that platform uh, for the new market historically. Um, we have had lower subprime representation in who gets auto loans compared to the U.S. population because, for example, uh, based on Equifax data, uh, looking at Vantage score, I think subprime is currently about 20% of consumers with a credit profile in, in the U.S., but prior to the pandemic, we averaged about 15% of new auto loans going to subprime. And that makes sense. The vehicle market is catered to a higher income, higher credit quality consumer. A lot of financing options like leasing are almost exclusive to higher credit uh, quality consumers. So it makes sense that they would be underrepresented. But at 15%, still a very important part of the market. Well, guess what it was in December on our platform? 5%. Uh, was subprime. And uh, similarly, deep subprime uh, was closer uh, historically to about 7% of new loans. It was 0.5% in December. So basically almost completely disappeared. Uh, and the, the trends in, in used are similar, just not as dramatic yet. So effectively, what this all means is we're reducing um, who can buy. The buying pool is smaller, but then when you think about it in terms of the loan base, it, it actually means that we have a much higher quality loan base, and that is likely to impact what we see in terms of loan performance uh, going forward, frankly, for the better.
For lenders, for for sure, that that would help portfolios. Um, I, I guess if you're thinking about the the broader economy or, or uh, implications for um, labor, if you know people in lower credit profiles can't get a car, or transportation, like what, what what are the implications there? If we're seeing fewer and fewer subprime and that is absolutely a, a huge implication, and and it's actually why I'm more concerned about this over the longer term than necessarily just what it means uh, right, right now. <clears throat> because regardless of, of where rates go, one of the problems is what is being produced in the new vehicle market. And, you know, I mentioned that earlier. Manufacturers have shifted to producing what higher income and wealthier consumers can afford, which is increasingly more expensive vehicles like full-size pickups and SUVs and luxury vehicles. But this is being done at the expense of affordable sedans and entry-level vehicles. And that's even a phrase that probably doesn't really apply to the new to the new vehicle any uh, market anymore entry level vehicles uh, the problem is that there are only so many of those households so as a result we're probably also being oriented to a new vehicle market that's going to produce fewer new vehicles than we historically have seen because the buying pool is is shrinking um, so, and then even it gets even more complicated because within the segments and models being produced, we are mainly seeing only the high end configurations being produced as well. So, when you add all that up, that means the used market will be fed by fewer of and increasingly more expensive vehicles that will take years of depreciation to eventually create a price point at which an affordable payment uh, can be produced. And that's even if interest rates stop going up and eventually start uh, coming back down uh, a bit. It's an environment where demand will be constrained and fewer transactions can be made as a result. And the implications for the U.S. are huge because we are very dependent on private transportation. Uh, we have uh, something along the lines of a 93% vehicle ownership rate. <laughs> So vehicles are a key part of how we get around. And if anything, the pandemic has caused people to migrate to places that are even more vehicle dependent uh, than what we had previously. And uh, public ridership is down. Uh, there are a lot of things that basically say the car is even even more important. And so this absolutely, just like housing, I believe transportation affordability will be a strain on uh, the U.S. economy and and what we can produce. And, um, you know, I guess the good news is there's going to be a lot of of people seeking solutions to this because there's plenty of people who, who uh, will represent opportunities if you can uh, come up with new, new solu solutions. Um, I also think if you're trying to look for the silver lining, well, there's a couple. Uh, one vehicles are lasting longer. So um, that gives us uh, an opportunity potentially to, to work our way through this. And as we talked about the loan basis, higher credit quality uh, too, which should mean that loan performance is uh, stronger and can enable lenders to um, you know, pursue other areas where risk um, could, uh, could be uh, increased uh, because it's being offset by, you know, that stronger loan performance. And one of those could be a return to longer terms that might make sense even in a used market that traditionally has been much shorter tr terms and uh, much higher risk. And I do think eventually rates will peak. Uh, there's no question that uh, everybody's forecasting that rates will peak sometime in 2023. It's just a question of when they start coming down and how much they will start uh, coming down. So when that happens, too, we will eventually at least uh, no longer see this affordability calculus getting worse and worse uh, every month. But, you know, it's a multifaceted scenario and, and no, no easy solutions, but one, I think, uh, the industry, including auto finance, uh, need, needs to be looking for ways to solve. Well, let's let's change gears a little bit. Certainly, lots to look at um, on the horizon um, with affordability. But in terms of how consumers are shopping um, during the pandemic, um, we saw a lot of consumers turn to online shopping. Um, certainly, pre-ordering. Um, do you think that trend or either of those trends will continue, or will we kind of go back to uh, brick and mortar, business as usual? What's what's on the lot? 
I think it's a little of both. The shift to online shopping and pre-ordering, no question, was accelerated by the pandemic. Um, but we don't see evidence of it fading uh, when it comes to what consumers say they want to do and, and how they're acting out. But I think it's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, and it's not just about low supplies basically created the only environment that this would take place. Uh, the recent research, uh, our uh, market research team at Cox Automotive did, uh, found that three quarters of shoppers indicated that they are more likely to buy from a dealer uh, in 2023 who provides the ability to com complete nearly all of the buying process uh, online. Uh, and I think that's an indication that consumers just as expect it. And frankly, I think it's directly related to how uh, understanding the credit uh, situation and what their rates will be and how that relates to their payments is such an important and upfront part of the purchase process that in their minds, you have to be able to do all of the process upfront um, because they can't even figure out um, if they can make a purchase happen without knowing the end game of the old world um, that was uh, completely dependent on w literally working through <laughs> departments uh, at the at the dealership. Um, but it's it's sort of ironic because it, I would I would point out that um, we continue to to be buying a physical asset uh, that you know that we're talking about, and we believe that fully digital. Uh, vehicle purchases, meaning transactions that are 100% done online, and the vehicle is simply delivered at the at the consumer's uh, house without any other uh, interaction, will actually only represent a small percentage of the business. And we don't really anticipate that going up much because actually what the consumer surveys indicate, and more importantly, what we observe consumers doing, is that most buyers desire and want you know, what the industry refers to as an omni-channel vehicle buying experience. They want to complete some purchase steps online. They absolutely don't want to have to repeat. They want it to be very efficient. So the thing that would make them most upset is to do some things online, then show up and find out they have to start all over again uh, with that tra transaction. But they actually want to go in the dealership. They want to touch, drive, and smell that new car. Um, so, you know, for, for us in the business of providing the platforms and helping to do the transaction, it basically means we have to give them their cake, um, re regardless of how they're going to slice it and eat it. Um, but, I, you know, I, I do think it does mean the credit part uh, is freed from the old shackles that really prevented a lot of people from exploring what's possible. Yeah, de demystifying some of that process and, and putting still a little bit of power back into the, the hands of the consumer is probably a good thing as we look ahead. So let's let's change gears again. I, I mentioned at the top of the podcast, the EV market and the EV landscape changing so much. Looking ahead, it looks like the stats we're seeing is that EV makers are cutting prices to make vehicles more affordable. And over the next few years, more than 100 EV models are due to be introduced. So what are you anticipating in terms of adoption, any barriers that the industry needs to overcome, all the things we've already talked about with, with pricing, um, um, supply chain. Um, wh wh what do you think? Yeah, well, the the EV part of the market is is the positive part of the market. No, no question about it. There's no negatives there. We're forecasting growth. Uh, we've started the year, yes, with a lot of high profile price cuts uh, being discussed, and at the same time, we have the new uh, tax credits that we think will also play a role in demand this year. Uh, so there's no question the EV market is the star growth part of the auto market. It's where all the excitement is going to be. And it's frankly where all the future uh, is going to be uh, kind of based on uh, what happens. Uh, and we're going to see some important growth milestones for electric vehicles in 2023 that is, is enabled by supply. Uh, we expect more than a million pure battery electric vehicles to be sold in the U.S. for the first time. Uh, there's going to be 27 new model launches um, that are helping to power this. Um, most of those model launches are coming from traditional brands, so uh, way more than what we've seen up until now. This means the average dealership is going to have something to offer consumers 
And this isn't just a Tesla thing and a California thing. This is happening across the country. Um, and what I mean by it being supply driven is that I don't think we're close to saturating uh, the potential demand from willing buyers um, with these volumes, uh, with expanded product availability, as well as those lower prices and uh, tax credits coming from the government to motivate buyers. We expect continued good news uh, in terms of what we see for sales. And so if we sell what is produced and delivered, we think um, battery electric vehicles will reach 8% of all new vehicles sold in the U.S., uh, which, you know, we hit 5% this past year for the first time and, and 8% will be continued strong growth. And actually, uh, what I find most interesting is if you add in all hybrids uh, and look at quote unquote, all electrified vehicles, um, they will reach a quarter of all new vehicles sold in the U.S. in, in 2023. So electrification really is, is becoming more common stream. And that means the car park is increasingly becoming more electric. And down the road, that means more used vehicle sales uh, will also uh, be electric. And of course, that's where uh, we're focusing on a lot of the uh, oppor opportunities or challenges because historically the used vehicle market ch judges the value of a used vehicle primarily on mileage. And in the future, mileage isn't going to mean much uh, for a battery electric. Instead, understanding where that car has has uh, been driven, how often it's been charged, how it's been charged, those are the kind of things that are going to tell you what, uh, what what is the health of the battery and what what is its like uh, you know likely life. You know I, I don't want to overstate and necessarily say there are no barriers. Um, there, there definitely are barriers, but what we see in consumer uh, survey data is is that the objections to uh, electric vehicles are, uh, declining. Uh, the top three are uh, the lack of charging stations and infrastructure, um, which uh, prior to uh, last year, the percentages on that were the majority of people. But for the first time, we fell below 50% of people saying there was a lack of charging stations. So we are seeing growth. And that's a chicken and egg issue. We need more vehicles out there in order to justify having more charging stations that can be managed more profitably in order to make people feel more comfortable. So I think we're making progress there. The performance of the battery, uh, it, it concerns about that battery, and ultimately the cost of the battery are the, are the two other issues. And we're seeing consumers' views of that also improve as we're seeing um, much longer range um, being offered in, in what's being provided. And I think as the facts sort of bake ba back up historically how long these batteries last, I think we'll start to address some of those challenges. So um, I think we're well on the way of seeing um, you know the beginning of those stages to eventually getting to a market that is uh, you know, 25, then 50%, um, you know, electric sometime over the next decade. Well, lots more to look for on the landscape or the EV market as well. And I've got a couple fun kind of close out questions for you here, Jonathan. This has been a really informative episode. I, I always love to end with in your consulting engagements and in all your work with Cox Automotive, what do you find yourself not being asked or um, consulting on that you think the industry needs to focus on more? What are we missing? Well, especially the finance part of the business, I would say what's top of mind that not many people are talking about is cash. Uh, with auto loan rates moving higher uh, quickly last year and now at 20-year highs, we actually saw a big rise in all cash deals uh, that kept going higher as the year progressed. And this has huge implications for profit pools for dealers and manufacturers and lenders alike. If people are buying with cash, that is diminishing the very number of finance transactions that we see. And it also has implications on future behaviors. We simply don't know uh, what's going to happen uh, with those buyers um, with regards to how does that change when they come back to buy? Um, uh, does it fundamentally change their loyalty to brands uh, in the way that financing like leasing has traditionally helped uh, keep helped make people uh, extremely loyal uh, to the to the brands that they've purchased from. So I think that that's a huge um, factor to pay attention to. 
Uh, unfortunately, I would argue that if rates are continuing to go up and we still have this ironic situation that the most affluent consumers are sitting on a pile of cash, uh, then it's very likely we're going to see even more cash deals in 2023. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's important to understand that really impacts what we see coming down the funnel. Thank you again for joining us, Jonathan. This was both a fun and informative episode. To learn more about how Equifax can provide a more personalized, frictionless, efficient, and secure buying experience with our data, analytics, and technology solutions, visit equifax.com forward slash auto. Also, be sure to check out and register for our Market Pulse monthly webinar series, and you can find that at equifax.com forward slash Market Pulse. And finally, let us know how we're doing with the podcast and what you might like to hear about in the future. Uh, you can email us and our team at marketpulsepodcast at equifax.com. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll catch you next time. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.